The force of friction is the force that resists motion. If we're talking about sliding friction, it's actually due to surfaces not being perfectly smooth. If we're talking about it sliding across, even surfaces like these two that look smooth to the naked eye, whenever we zoom in, they actually have teeny ridges, valleys, and mountains that will interlock and we have to scrape them past and jump over things. Now, now the equation for friction, force of friction equals the coefficient of friction, mu, times the normal force. Now, normal force we talked about last time in free body diagrams. The coefficient of friction is an idea of how rough the surfaces are and the reason that normal force is in this equation is it's a judge of how hard the surfaces are being pushed together. I mean, if you think about it, uh, imagine taking your hands, putting them together. Your hands have some roughness. You can actually see that in the fingerprint, handprint. They interlock together. If you press them harder together, you are actually increasing the normal force. If you press them hard together and you rub, you can already feel that there's going to be more friction. Now, there are two different types of friction that we need to deal with. Static friction occurs whenever an object is stationary. That's what static, if you will, means. Uh, that the difference between the surfaces, if we had, let's say, this box on this table here, the surfaces are not actually sliding past each other. It is stationary. In that case, friction is a force pushing the opposite way than the box would want to move. So if the box is trying to get pushed this way here, friction is going to go the opposite way, trying to resist the motion. Um, force of friction, whenever we're talking about static, stationary, is actually not always equal to mu times normal force. That's actually the maximum amount of force that it can apply. Instead, static friction is just trying to keep the box stationary. So you push a little bit harder and friction will perfectly balance it out. You push even harder, friction perfectly balances it out. Till eventually, the force of friction goes up, 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 until finally you overcome static friction. Whenever you do that, you actually get the box moving and we enter into what's called kinetic friction, this section of the graph. Notice how the force of friction actually drops at that moment. Here, the, uh, the kinetic friction isn't as great as static friction. Main reason behind that, if, if you just think about, if you will, your logical experience instead, uh, whenever you have something moving, it's actually easier to keep it going than whenever it's stationary to get it to start going. So you even feel this little drop off in friction. Now, the coefficient of friction, part of the equation, force of friction equals mu times normal force, is actually uh, something that might feel odd to you as a physics student because it is a unitless number. It's actually, if you will, just a multiplier. If I think about units, force of friction has the units of newtons. Normal force has the unit of newtons. So this must not have a unit, must not have a unit so I would have newtons times just some number gives me Newtons there. Uh, the force, or excuse me, the coefficient of friction will also almost always be less than one. I mean, check out these coefficient of frictions in this table. You don't have to write this table down by any means, um, but check out the coefficient of frictions. Notice how they're all decimal numbers. Uh, in fact, whenever the coefficient of friction was initially being set up in the equation, they wanted it to always be less than one. Now, we found some things that are greater than one, but, but that's very, very rare to say the least. You won't encounter anything like that. Last thing that I want to point about the coefficient of frictions, I said static friction is always greater than kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is constant. It actually obeys the mu times normal force equation. Static friction is always less than or equal to mu times normal force where this is the maximum. Notice how the coefficient of friction for static is almost always greater than the coefficient of friction for kinetic. All right, first example problem here. A mover is pushing a 35 kilogram box. Uh, that then tells me my mass across the floor. To keep it moving at a constant velocity, anytime you see the terms constant velocity, go ahead and box that. That tells you your acceleration, which in this case is zero meters per second squared. Doesn't matter how fast it's going, five meters per second, 10 meters per second. If it's going at a constant velocity, acceleration is zero meters per second squared. And the mover pushes the uh, books that are in that box uh, with 138 newtons of force. And I'm looking for the coefficient of friction, mu equals question mark in this problem. First step that you always do on these problems, on any Newton's law problem, is draw a free body diagram. Don't overthink it, just simply put down all the forces that you have. I have a force of push, 
you can label that with the number if you want, 138 newtons, um, because the, the mover is pushing it. I also know I have some friction here. Friction goes opposite the direction of motion, so I'm going back to the left. I'm going to try to draw that the same length as the force of push, because I'm going at a constant velocity, so I already know that has to be equal there, and if you don't necessarily draw it um, to be exactly the same, it's okay, but that's a concept that you need to be aware of. Uh, the box is on Earth, so I'm going to have gravity going down, and it's on a surface, so I'm going to have normal going up, but normal and gravity should also balance out. Next step after you do your free body diagram, choose positives and negatives. I'm going to call up positive and to the right positive, which means left and down must be negative. Next step, choose an axis that you want to work in to start out with. I'm going to choose to work in the x-axis. It actually doesn't matter if you choose the y, but I'm going to choose the x-axis because that's where the box is actually moving, in the x-axis. So let's label it. I'm going to work in the x-axis. Sum of the forces equals ma. And then simply read off your free body diagram what are those forces that are there. I see a positive F push and a negative force of friction. That then fills in the left-hand side of my equation here. The sum of the forces, I have a positive F push and a negative force of friction over here, equals MA. Next step, just start trying to plug in, plug in numbers as you can. Start, start substituting in. It's nice if you can work this only in letters, but for now, we'll go ahead and we'll start plugging in what numbers we have to see what we are left with. So I know F push is 138 newtons. I don't know the force of friction. Whenever you don't know a force, though, like the force of friction, oftentimes you will actually be able to substitute in from the equation. The force of friction is mu times normal force. So I can actually plug in mu times normal force for that. Let's keep working on the next line. Let's, let's just keep working this until I'm out and can't do anything else. Well, I don't know the coefficient of friction. That's what I'm looking for. I don't know the normal force yet. There's nothing about that in the problem. I do know the mass, 35 kilograms. And I do know the acceleration, zero meters per second uh, squared, because it's moving at a constant velocity. At this point in time, you say to yourself, hey, I'm looking for the coefficient of friction. If only I knew the normal force, then I would be able to solve this problem. Let me backtrack here. Let me backtrack here for a second and actually talk about good problem-solving techniques with these. Uh, do your free body diagram, choose an axis, and set it up, and then just start, just start working down. Don't worry about trying to figure out how you're going to end up getting to the answer yet. Just start trying to fill in the equation as far as you can, working line by line by line, until finally you get stuck. And in this case, now I'm stuck. Now, the trick with friction is to recognize, hey, I'm stuck and I need normal force. So how this becomes new is let's go set up the y-axis. Sum of the forces equals ma equation. In the y-axis, it looks like I have a positive normal and a negative gravity. So we can substitute those two in on the left-hand side of the equation. Let's start substituting in numbers again. As much as I know, I don't know normal force. I don't know the force of gravity, but I can put in mass times 9.81. Fg is mg, I know the mass, 35 kilograms, and I know the acceleration in the y-axis. This box is not flying up into the air, it's not plunging down to the depths of the earth, so the acceleration must be zero in, in the y-axis. Well, let's keep working this line until we get all the way stuck. 35 times 9.81, positive 9.81, right? We've already dealt with direction uh, with the negative FG, so don't use negative 9.81, equals zero. So now simply working my algebra, multiplying 35 times 9.81, then I'm going to add 343.35 over to the other side, and I, could, and I end up with what normal force? 35 Fn equals 343.35 newtons. That now gives me the ability to substitute that in for normal force over here in the x-axis. And now from here, it's just basic algebra. I'm going to subtract my 138 over to the other side, and then I'm going to divide both sides by negative, because of this negative sign right here, 343.35 to find the coefficient of friction. 
And doing negative 138 divided by negative 343.35 gives me a coefficient of friction of 0 0.40 using two significant figures. Looks like I have two sig figs up here and the 35 kilogram box, three over here in the force of push. So we'll go with two sig figs since that is the least. Um, things to be aware of. You won't always being so, be, uh, you won't always solve for mu or the coefficient of friction. Sometimes maybe you solve for the acceleration and because it's not going at it's not going at constant velocity, but the steps still remain the same. Do a free body diagram, label all the forces. You might have more forces than just F push and force of friction. There might be times whenever you are trying to slow down a lot, and so F push is backwards also, and so you have negative force of push and negative force of friction. So pay attention and do your free body diagram correctly. Sum up the forces in the x-axis. You could go ahead and set up the y if you wanted to. Work it all the way down. Common substitution is replacing the force of friction with mu times normal force. Keep working, and at some point in time, you're going to get stuck, and you're going to need normal. Bounce over to the Y. FG can become MG. Solve all the way down to normal force. That will let you substitute in and be able to solve for what you need. Let's look at a second example problem now where we're actually going to end up, in the end, using a kinematic equation after we find the acceleration using F equals MA. Uh, so it looks like, once again, we, we do know the mass of the car. And uh, we also know the initial velocity of the car, too, over here, uh, 27 meters per second. And it slams on brakes to try to stop. Hmm, we know the final velocity, V equals zero meters per second, before getting in a wreck. The coefficient of friction between the tires and the road is they give us mu in this case. And then part A says calculate the deceleration of, of the car. Now, if you're, if you're doing a variable bank here, U equals uh, 27 meters per second, V equals zero, M equals 3,500 kilograms, um, mu equals 0.75, and you're looking for A to start out with, one of the things that you'll notice is you do not have enough information to use a kinematic equation yet. You have the initial velocity and the final velocity, but you need one more piece. You're going to either need the time or the displacement if you were going to use a kinematic equation. That must not be the route that I'm going to go. Plus, look, at B, I'm going to end up getting the stopping distance of the car. So I probably should use Newton's second law, sum of the forces equals ma, to get the acceleration in a, and then a kinematic to be able to get b. So let's go ahead and let's make a free body diagram. Notice how in this free body diagram, I've got normal going up because the car is on a surface, gravity going down, the car is on Earth, so there is a force of gravity, um, and friction going backwards in this case. Uh, there is no force of engine going forward or, or, or any force of push, because whenever you are trying to stop, you take your foot off the gas and you put it on the brake trying to stop. So the only thing stopping you is the friction between the brake pads and, 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 and the rotors inside there, which is limited by the friction between the car's tires uh, and, and the road. So now positives and negatives, and then let's start setting up our equations. Now, in, in the x-axis, if I'm going to choose to the left to be negative and the, the right to be positive in this case, I only have one force. I only have the negative force of friction that's going to go on that left-hand side. So negative force of friction equals ma in this case because it's just a car trying to stop. There, there are no other forces there in the x-axis. Now, that can break down into, because I don't know the force of friction, mu times normal force, common thing that you're going to break friction into, go ahead and put in mu times normal force. Um, and I no mu, so let's put that in, 0.75, the coefficient of static friction between the tires and pavement is, is pretty strong. I don't know normal force yet. I do know the mass, right? That's 3,500. Um, and I'm solving for the acceleration. You say to yourself, man, if only I knew the normal force, then I could get A. So let's go to the y-axis. Reading off my free body diagram to fill in the left-hand side of the equation, I have a positive normal and a negative gravity. Um, and I know the acceleration in this case. It's a car. It's accelerating left and right, so A is going to be zero. So going ahead and also changing my force of gravity, another common substitution that you do, Fg changes into mass times 9.81. If A is zero, zero times anything, like zero times M, is, is zero, and now I can solve for normal force. So then I can add this uh, negative 
34,335, add that to the other side. Normal force equals 34,335. Let's go ahead and let's debunk a thing that ends up happening to kids. Um, kids end up recognizing, hey, the normal force is the same as mg gravity if the acceleration is zero, which for oftentimes in our problems right now, it will be. But that's not always the case. As soon as you get to something that's at an angle, then normal force just isn't equal to the force of gravity. It's actually going to be equal to mg cosine theta. Um, if you are in an, if you are in an elevator or if you're on a surface that is accelerating upwards or downwards for some odd reason, then the acceleration isn't zero. So don't just make that assumption. Actually work the y-axis sum of the forces equals ma equation. Now that I have my, uh, now that I have my normal force, I'm going to be able to substitute that in and solve for a. So now I just need to divide both sides by the 3,500 over here. And I end up with an acceleration of 7.3575 meters per second squared with significant figures. Two significant figures. That rounds to 7.4. Now that I know that, let's put that in our variable bank over here. A is 7.4 meters per second squared. By the way, whenever we substitute this in, we're actually going to use the unrounded number. Now I have enough information that for part B, solving for S, I can use a kinematic. It looks like we have, uh, we're looking for S, we know A, we know V, we know U, we don't know time, so I'm going to use the kinematic equation V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. Now, I actually made a mistake that I need to go back and correct this. That's very, very important. Notice, notice it's negative 25,000 divided by positive 35. Uh, 3,500, that should give me a negative acceleration. And that negative acceleration is quite important because, look, I called things that go to the left negative. That means this acceleration should be negative, right? It's a deceleration here. Negative, negative there. The car is initially going to the right. So its initial velocity should be positive. Getting those signs correct whenever you're plugging into your kinematic is critical. So after working that algebra all the way through here, 27 squared, 729, 0 times uh, 0 squared is 0 plus any number, so this 0 can completely go away 2 times, negative 7.357, um, uh, 9, or excuse me, 5, 14, divide that 14.715 over. I get a uh, stopping distance here or a displacement, a positive 49.541. But, but using the two sig figs that I have in the problem, this would become a 50 with a decimal point meters.